Section ten of Tanglewood Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Ferguson. Tanglewood Tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Circe's Palace, Part Two. Eurylochus and his followers now passed under a lofty portal and looked through the open doorway into the interior of the palace. The first thing that they saw was a spacious hall, and a fountain in the middle of it, gushing up towards the ceiling out of a marble basin, and falling back into it with a continual splash. The water of this fountain, as it spouted upward, was constantly taking new shapes, not very distinctly, but plainly enough for a nimble fancy to recognise what they were. Now it was the shape of a man in a long robe, the fleecy whiteness of which was made out of the fountain spray. Now it was a lion, or a tiger, or a wolf, or an ass, or as often as anything else a hog, wallowing in the marble basin as if it were his sty. It was either magic, or some very curious machinery, that caused the gushing water-spout to assume all these forms. But before the strangers had time to look closely at this wonderful sight, their attention was drawn off by a very sweet and agreeable sound. A woman's voice was singing melodiously in another room of the palace, and with her voice was mingled the noise of a loom, at which she was probably seated, weaving a rich texture of cloth and intertwining the high and low sweetness of her voice into a rich tissue of harmony. By and by the song came to an end, and then, all at once, there were several feminine voices, talking airily and cheerfully, with now and then a merry burst of laughter, such as you may always hear when three or four young women sit at work together. "'What a sweet song that was!' exclaimed one of the voyagers. "'Too sweet, indeed,' answered Eurylochus, shaking his head. "'Yet it was not so sweet as the song of the sirens, those bird-like damsels who wanted to tempt us on the rocks, so that our vessel might be wrecked and our bones left whitening along the shore.' But just listen to the pleasant voices of those maidens, and that buzz of the loom as the shuttle passes to and fro," said another comrade. What a domestic household home-like sound it is! Ah, before that weary siege of Troy I used to hear the buzzing loom and the women's voices under my own roof. Shall I never hear them again, nor taste those nice little savoury dishes which my dearest wife knew how to serve up? Tush! We shall fare better here," said another. But how innocently those women are babbling together, without guessing that we overhear them! And mark that richest voice of all, so pleasant and so familiar, but which yet seems to have the authority of a mistress among them. Let us show ourselves at once. What harm can the lady of the palace and her maidens do to mariners and warriors like us? Remember, said Eurylochus, that it was a young maiden who beguiled three of our friends into the palace of the king of the Lestrigones, who ate up one of them in the twinkling of an eye. No warning or persuasion, however, had any effect on his companions. They went up to a pair of folding doors at the farther end of the hall, and throwing them wide open, passed into the next room. Eurylochus, meanwhile, had stepped behind a pillar. In the short moment while the folding doors opened and closed again, he caught a glimpse of a very beautiful woman, rising from the loom and coming to meet the poor weather-beaten wanderers, with a hospitable smile and her hand stretched out in welcome. There were four other young women, who joined their hands and danced merrily forward, making gestures of obeisance to the strangers. They were only less beautiful than the lady who seemed to be their mistress. Yet Eurylochus fancied that one of them had sea-green hair, and that the close-fitting bodice of a second looked like the bark of a tree, and that both the others had something odd in their aspect, although he could not quite determine what it was, in the little while that he had to examine them. The folding doors swung quickly back and left him standing behind the pillar, in the solitude of the outer hall. There Eurylochus waited until he was quite weary, and listened eagerly to every sound but without hearing anything that could help him to guess what had become of his friends. Footsteps, it is true, seemed to be passing and repassing in other parts of the palace. Then there was a clatter of silver dishes, or golden ones, which made him imagine a rich feast in a splendid banqueting hall. But by and by he heard a tremendous grunting and squealing, 
and then a sudden scampering, like that of small hard hooves, over a marble floor, while the voices of the mistress and her four handmaidens were screaming all together, in tones of anger and derision. Eurylochus could not conceive what had happened, unless a drove of swine had broken into the palace attracted by the smell of the feast. Chancing to cast his eyes at the fountain, he saw that it did not shift its shape as formerly, nor looked either like a long-robed man, or a lion, a tiger, a wolf, or an ass. It looked like nothing but a hog, which lay wallowing in the marble basin, and filled it from brim to brim. But we must leave the prudent Eurylochus waiting in the outer hall, and follow his friends into the inner secrecy of the palace. As soon as the beautiful woman saw them, she arose from the loom, as I have told you, and came forward, smiling and stretching out her hand. She took the hand of the foremost among them, and bade him and the whole party welcome. "'You have been long expected, my good friends,' said she. "'I and my maidens are well acquainted with you, although you do not appear to recognize us. Look at this piece of tapestry, and judge if your faces must not have been familiar to us.' So the voyagers examined the web of cloth which the beautiful woman had been weaving in her loom, and to their vast astonishment they saw their own figures perfectly represented in different coloured threads. It was a lifelike picture of their recent adventures, showing them in the cave of Polyphemus, and how they had put out his one great moony eye, while in another part of the tapestry they were untying the leathern bags, puffed out with contrary winds, and farther on they beheld themselves scampering away from the gigantic king of the Lestrigones, who had caught one of them by the leg. Lastly, there they were, sitting on the desolate shore of this very island, hungry and downcast, and looking ruefully at the bare bones of the stag, which they devoured yesterday. This was as far as the work had yet proceeded, but when the beautiful woman should again sit down at her loom, she would probably make a picture of what had since happened to the strangers, and of what was now going to happen. "'You see,' she said, that I know all about your troubles, and you cannot doubt that I desire to make you happy for as long a time as you may remain with me. For this purpose, my honoured guests, I have ordered a banquet to be prepared. Fish, fowl, and flesh, roasted and in luscious stews, and seasoned, I trust to all your tastes, are ready to be served up. If your appetites tell you it is dinner-time, then come with me to the feast or saloon." At this kind invitation the hungry mariners were quite overjoyed, and one of them, taking upon himself to be spokesman, assured their hospitable hostess that any hour of the day was dinner-time with them, whenever they could get flesh to put in the pot and fire to boil it with. So the beautiful woman led the way, and the four maidens, one of them had sea-green hair, another a bodice of oak-bark, a third sprinkled a shower of water-drops from her fingers' ends and the fourth had some other oddity which I have forgotten. All these followed behind, and hurried the guests along until they entered a magnificent saloon. It was built in a perfect oval, and lighted from a crystal dome above. Around the walls were ranged two and twenty thrones, overhung by canopies of crimson and gold, and provided with the softest of cushions, which were tasselled and fringed with gold cord. Each of the strangers was invited to sit down, and there they were, two-and-twenty storm-beaten mariners, in worn and tattered garb, sitting in two-and-twenty cushioned and canopied thrones, so rich and gorgeous that the proudest monarch had nothing more splendid in his stateliest hall. Then you might have seen the guests nodding, winking with one eye, and leaning from one throne to another, to communicate their satisfaction in hoarse whispers. "'Our good hostess has made kings of us all,' said one. "'Ha! Ah, do you smell the feast? I'll engage it will be fit to set before two-and-twenty kings.' "'I hope,' said another, "'it will be mainly good substantial joints, sirloins, spare-ribs, and hinder-quarters, without too many kickshaws. If I thought the good lady would not take it amiss, I should call for a fat slice of fried bacon to begin with.' Ah, the gluttons and gourmandizers! You see how it was with them. 
in the loftiest seats of dignity on royal thrones they could think of nothing but their greedy appetite which was the portion of their nature that they shared with the wolves and swine so that they resembled those vilest of animals far more than they did kings if indeed kings were what they ought to be but the beautiful woman now clapped her hands and immediately there entered a train of two-and-twenty serving-men bringing dishes of the richest food all hot from the kitchen fire and sending up such a steam that it hung like a cloud below the crystal dome of the saloon an equal number of attendants brought great flagons of wine of various kinds some of which sparkled as it was poured out and went bubbling down the throat while of other sorts the purple liquor was so clear that you could see the wrought figures at the bottom of the goblet while the servants supplied the two-and-twenty guests with food and drink the hostess and her four maidens went from one throne to another exhorting them to eat their fill and to quaff wine abundantly and thus to recompense themselves at this one banquet for the many days when they had gone without a dinner but whenever the mariners were not looking at them which was pretty often as they looked chiefly into the basins and platters the beautiful woman and her damsels turned aside and laughed even the servants as they knelt down to present the dishes might be seen to grin and sneer while the guests were helping themselves to the offered dainties and once in a while the strangers seemed to taste something that they did not like here is an odd kind of spice in this dish said one i can't say it quite suits my palate down it goes however send a good draught of wine down your throat said his comrade on the next throne that is the stuff to make this sort of cookery relish well though i must needs say the wine has a queer taste too but the more i drink of it the better i like the flavour whatever little fault they might find with the dishes they sat at dinner a prodigiously long while and it would really have made you ashamed to see how they swilled down the liquor and gobbled up the food they sat on golden thrones to be sure but they behaved like pigs in a sty and if they had their wits about them they might have guessed that this was the opinion of their beautiful hostess and her maidens it brings a blush into my face to reckon up in my own mind what mountains of meat and pudding and what gallons of wine these two-and-twenty guzzlers and gormandizers ate and drank they forgot all about their homes and their wives and children and all about ulysses and everything else except this banquet at which they wanted to keep feasting for ever but at length they began to give over from mere incapacity to hold any more that last bit of fat is too much for me said one and i have not room for another morsel said his next neighbour heaving a sigh what a pity my appetite is as sharp as ever in short they all left off eating and leaned back on their thrones with such a stupid and helpless aspect as made them ridiculous to behold when their hostess saw this she laughed aloud so did her four damsels so did the two-and-twenty serving-men that bore the dishes and their two-and-twenty fellows that poured out the wine and the louder they all laughed the more stupid and helpless did the two-and-twenty gormandizers look then the beautiful woman took her stand in the middle of the saloon and stretching out a slender rod it had been all the while in her hand although they never noticed it till this moment she turned it from one guest to another until each had felt it pointed at himself beautiful as her face was and though there was a smile on it it looked just as wicked and mischievous as the ugliest serpent that ever was seen and fat-witted as the voyagers had made themselves they began to suspect that they had fallen into the power of an evil-minded enchantress wretches cried she you have abused a lady's hospitality and in this princely saloon your behaviour has been suited to a hog-pen you are already swine in everything but the human form which you disgrace and which i myself should be ashamed to keep a moment longer were you to share it with me but it would require only the slightest exercise of magic to make the exterior conform to the hoggish disposition assume your proper shapes gormandizers and begone to the sty uttering these last words she waved her wand and stamping her foot imperiously each of the guests was struck aghast at beholding instead of his comrades in human shape one-and-twenty hogs sitting on the same number of golden thrones each man 
as he still supposed himself to be, essayed to give a cry of surprise, but found that he could merely grunt, and that, in a word, he was just such another beast as his companions. It looked so intolerably absurd to see hogs on cushioned thrones, that they made haste to wallow down upon all fours like other swine. They tried to groan and beg for mercy, but forthwith emitted the most awful grunting and squealing that ever came out of swinish throats. They would have wrung their hands in despair, but attempting to do so grew all the more desperate for seeing themselves squatted on their hams, and pouring the air with their fore-trotters. Dear me, what pendulous ears they had, what little red eyes, half buried in fat, and what long snouts instead of the Grecian noses! But brutes as they certainly were, they yet had enough of human nature in them to be shocked at their own hideousness, and still intending to groan, they uttered a viler grunt and squeal than before. So harsh and ear-piercing it was, that you would have fancied a butcher was sticking his knife into each of their throats, or at very least that somebody was pulling every hog by his funny little twist of a tail. "'Be gone to your sty!' cried the enchantress, giving them some smart strokes with her wand, and then she turned to the serving-men. "'Drive out these swine, and throw down some acorns for them to eat.' The door of the saloon being flung open, the drove of hogs ran in all directions save the right one, in accordance with their hoggish perversity, but were finally driven into the backyard of the palace. It was a sight to bring tears into one's eyes, and I hope none of you will be cruel enough to laugh at it, to see the poor creatures go snuffing along, picking up here a cabbage leaf and there a turnip top, and rooting their noses in the earth for whatever they could find. In their sty, moreover, they behaved more piggishly than the pigs that had been born so, for they bit and snorted at one another, put their feet in the trough, and gobbled up their victuals in a ridiculous hurry, and when there was nothing more to be had, they made a great pile of themselves among some unclean straw, and fell fast asleep. If they had any human reason left, it was just enough to keep them wondering when they should be slaughtered, and what quality of bacon they should make. Meantime, as I told you before, Eurylochus had waited, and waited, and waited in the entrance hall of the palace, without being able to comprehend what had befallen his friends. At last, when the swinish uproar resounded through the palace, and when he saw the image of a hog in the marble basin, he thought it best to hasten back to the vessel, and inform the wise Ulysses of these marvellous occurrences. So he ran as fast as he could down the steps, and never stopped to draw breath till he reached the shore. "'Why do you come alone?' asked King Ulysses, as soon as he saw him. "'Where are your two-and-twenty comrades?' At these questions Eurylochus burst into tears. "'Alas!' he cried. "'I greatly fear that we shall never see one of their faces again.' Then he told Ulysses all that had happened, as far as he knew it, and added that he suspected the beautiful woman to be a vile enchantress, and the marble palace, magnificent as it looked, to be only a dismal cavern in reality. As for his companions, he could not imagine what had become of them, unless they had been given to the swine to be devoured alive. At this intelligence all of the voyagers were greatly affrighted. But Ulysses lost no time in girding on his sword, and hanging his bow and quiver over his shoulder, and taking a spear in his right hand. When his followers saw their wise leader making these preparations, they inquired whither he was going, and earnestly besought him not to leave them. "'You are our king,' cried they, "'and what is more, you are the wisest man in the whole world, and nothing but your wisdom and courage can get us out of this danger. If you desert us and go to the enchanted palace, you will suffer the same fate as our poor companions, and not a soul of us will ever see our dear Ithaca again. "'As I am your king,' answered Ulysses, "'and wiser than any of you, it is therefore the more my duty to see what has befallen our comrades, and whether anything can yet be done to rescue them. Wait for me here until to-morrow.' If I do not then return, you must hoist sail and endeavour to find your way to our native land. For my part, I am answerable for the fate of these poor mariners, who have stood by my side in battle, and been so often drenched to the skin, along with me, by the same tempestuous surges. 
I will either bring them back with me, or perish. Had his followers dared, they would have detained him by force. But King Ulysses frowned sternly on them, and shook his spear, and bade them stop him at their peril. Seeing him so determined, they let him go, and sat down on the sand, as disconsolate a set of people as could be, waiting and praying for his return. It happened to Ulysses, just as before, that when he had gone a few steps from the edge of the cliff, the purple bird came fluttering towards him, crying, Peep, 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 and using all the art it could to persuade him to go no farther. What mean you, little bird? cried Ulysses. You are arrayed like a king in purple and gold, and wear a golden crown upon your head. Is it because I too am a king that you desire so earnestly to speak with me? If you can talk in human language, say what you would have me do. Peep, answered the purple bird very dolorously. Peep, peep, peep. End of part two of Circe's Palace. Recording by Linda Ferguson.